Welcome back to the Cloud Church. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to Spanish and English speaking people. We've been going verse by verse through the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written, and we are now in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, let's just briefly remember what we've been talking about in context of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was a letter written to the people in Corinth who were saved, according to verse 1 and 2, the saints or the saved people but also not only in Corinth, but everywhere, over the whole world. So this book is written to us as well, who are Christians. It says, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, and then it says, to them which are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, or Lord, I, I added the word Lord, of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So this book is written to all saved people everywhere. And in verse Five, it warns us about fornication, how we need to stay away from fornication. Verse 6 talks about judging and knowing how to judge correctly and again stay away from fornication because the body is not for fornication. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 7, he goes into the rules of marriage and how important it is to be married so that you don't fornicate. And then chapter 8, last time we looked at idols and we saw how idols were connected with fornication. Idol worship is a form of fornication, or it leads to fornication when you worship idols. I uh, forgot to say that many of the idols that they worshipped in ancient times were fertility gods and fertility goddesses. So they worshipped their idol before they'd have sex in the hopes that worshipping that idol will produce fruit, produce a child, produce a baby. So idols and fornication join hand in hand. And now we come to chapter 9, which has very little to say about idol worship and fornication. If anything, it's, it's Paul defending himself from their accusations. And we see clearly from chapter 9 that they wrote to Paul and they, they questioned Paul. They had questions about Paul, but they kind of they looked at Paul as like, who are you to tell us what to do? Well, Paul was the one who went there and led them to the Lord, number one. But we also see in chapter 9 how they were questioning Paul. And we will see that as we get into the book. So, uh, chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians... And we'll look at verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to go real in detail into this about what is an apostle. So let's get started here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and as always, get your King James Bible. 1611 authorized version, please. King James Bible. Uh, chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not an apostle? So the apostle Paul says, am I not an apostle? Well, we're going to look at today as we go through this book, what is an apostle? There are a lot of people that think that they're still apostles today. Is that true? Are there still apostles today? Well, we know for sure Paul was an apostle. He says, am I not an apostle? That's a question. Well, he answers that in other places. Am I not free? What does he mean by free? Well, we'll look at that also in this chapter. That freedom that he's talking about is, is am I not free in Christ? But he's also, he's saying, I'm free as a Roman citizen. Just like we in America say, hey, we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. Am I not free? Now, back to verse 1. Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So he goes eight chapters talking about a lot of different subjects, and he asks a couple questions. But here he's asking question after question after question after question. In fact, uh, verse 1 is several questions. Verse 4 is a question. Verse 5 is a question. Verse 6 is a question. Verse 7 is three or four, three questions. Verse 8 is two questions. Verse 9 is a question. Verse 10, I mean, so this whole chapter he's asking questions. Verse 11 ends in a question mark. Verse 13 ends in a question mark. Um, so the Apostle Paul is going through, he, he's saying, look, I've dealt with your problems. I've showed you things. I'm telling you this is what the Bible says. And now let me ask you some questions you that think ill of me. You that think I'm, I'm wrong or there's something wrong or asking who I am, let me ask you some questions. And so that's what chapter 9 is all about. So verse 1 says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. So there you go. They're examining him. They're asking, who are you, Paul? Defend yourself. Tell us who you are. Tell us about, did God really call you to do what you're doing? So let's go into this and let's get into apostle. What is an apostle according to the Bible? Where do they come from? How many are there? And are there still apostles around today? It's common in the world today to see people that in churches to say, well, I'm apostle so-and-so and I'm apostle so-and-so. 
But are there apostles today? Is it right to call oneself an apostle? There are preachers today that call themselves reverent. I can't stand that. In the book of Psalms, it's talking about God. It says, holy and reverent is his name. So why would a man try to steal the name of God and say, no, call me reverent? When reverend is the name of God. I don't understand that. Well, there are people today that want to steal titles in the Bible and apply them to themselves and say, look at me, I'm an apostle. Are you really an apostle? What are the apostles? Where do they come from? Let's go to Luke chapter 6. We're going to look at that today. What is an apostle? And what we're going to find is that there are no more apostles today, according to the Word of God. And there can't be. The apostles were founded to start the church. And God used them to build his church. But the, the apostles eventually died out. And we'll see also that Paul was the very last apostle. He even said that he was born out of due season, the last apostle. We're going to look at those verses. And I hope this is a blessing to you. Important to learn and study the word of God so you don't be deceived. And so many people are deceived today. There's a church up the road from where we live that calls itself the Apostolic Such and Such Church. And you go there, and the man who claims to be the minister, the preacher, says, I'm Apostle so-and-so. Is he really? Is he, an is he an apostle? Well, let's look at that. Luke chapter 6, and, and this might take up the, t the entire hour, I don't know. But uh, there are some things that we need to, to get into that are so important, and this is one of them. Luke chapter 6, verse 13. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. This is Jesus. And of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. So how many apostles were there? Well, there were 12 apostles, only 12. And we'll see that when we get to the end of this study, what I'm teaching you, there has only ever been 12 true apostles, and there only ever will be 12 true apostles. There's no more than 12 apostles. Now, I know there's some people that say, well, there might be 13 or 14 apostles, but there can't be, as we'll see from the Scriptures. But uh, Luke chapter 13, and uh, let's look at uh, verse 14, okay? I read verse 13, and he chose 12, whom also he named apostles. For so Jesus named them apostles. And then in verse 14, 15, 16, it gives the name of the apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes. And Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. So one of those apostles was a devil. Jesus says, have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? That one devil was Judas. And as we'll see, Judas eventually was killed, and somebody took his place. All right, so let's go to some more verses. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Once again, we get a list of the names of of the apostles. And incidentally, in this list of the names of the apostles is not the name of that man that lives down the road that has a church and he calls himself an apostle. His name's not in the list here. So he can't be one of the apostles. There's only 12 apostles. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1 through 7. And in Matthew 10, 1 through 7, the Bible says, When he had called unto him the twelve apostles, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the name of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Le Lebeus, um, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, the bad one. Then Jesus, and then it says what Jesus did, and I'm going to read that, verse, starting at verse 5, but let me go ahead and put up here what I always put up here. This is so important. People don't rightly divide the word of truth. Here is the cross of Calvary. And here is, oh, well, let's put it right here, the birth of Jesus. Here's Jesus Christ's birth. Okay? Now, in this time period from when he was born, well, actually, when three, Jesus was 30 years old, he began to have a ministry, the Bible says. And so for three and a half years, Jesus Christ had his ministry here on earth. And this is where he called out his 12 disciples, which, by the way, were his 12 disciples apostles. So the apostles that he chose were also disciples and vice versa. Well these disciples when Jesus died and was buried and rose again, these apostles came out and they started on this side a ministry. And so the apostles came over and started preaching after Jesus. Let me move my line over. 
What we're about to find out is there was another man who was another apostle. And that apostle was used by God as change changed. Because when Jesus Christ came, he came only to the Jews. To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when the church started, Jesus sent his apostles to Jews. You can't deny that. The Bible plain, plainly teaches that. So, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, look what it says. These twelve Jesus sent forth, the twelve disciples, twelve apostles, and commanded them, saying, now listen to this, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. The Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. They had mixed, I believe, with the Phoenicians, if I remember correctly. He says, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So only go to Jews. Jewish apostles only to Jews. Only going to Jews, not Gentiles. And he says, As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, clean the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. And so he tells them what to do, and he goes to and he says, Preach the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? Well, we don't have time to go into that today, but there are two kingdoms in the Bible. There's one called the kingdom of God. And we're told in the book of Romans, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual kingdom. And we today are in the kingdom of God. When we're born again, we're born into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. A physical, literal kingdom and that's the kingdom in which Jesus comes and reigns on earth. Well, when, that, when will that be? Well, over here is the rapture of the church. After the rapture is the time called the tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus returns at Armageddon, and he sets up his millennial kingdom where he rules and reigns for a thousand years. This will be the physical kingdom of heaven. The physically, Jesus physically will be on earth. That's the millennial kingdom. I'll abbreviate it there. So when Jesus Christ came, this is so important. Many people don't understand that. That's why this is so important. Jesus came as a Jew, preached only to Jews. He tells these apostles, these disciples, don't preach to any Gentiles, only to Jews. And then when Jesus dies and buried and risen again, he sends out these apostles to Jews. Why? Because there is a chance that that could have started right here. Had the Jewish nation as a whole accepted their Messiah when he rose again from the dead, he could have come back and started his kingdom right there. But as you read through the book of Acts, and if you get a chance, go to cloudchurch.org, look under Bible studies, understanding the book of Acts, you'll see what had took place. The Jewish nation as a whole rejected the Messiah. Those Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all those evil people, they said, no, we will not have this Messiah. So when the church started, it started going to Jews, but when the Jewish nation as a whole rejected Jesus, it's almost like there's a parenthesis here. God said, okay, from now on, I'm going to the Gentiles with the message of salvation. And that's when up shows another apostle that replaces Judas Iscariot. Who was that apostle? By now you probably know it's the apostle Paul, which we'll look at in a minute. So... The apostles started out Jews going to Jews. So why is the Apostle Paul in the Bible? Because the Apostle Paul was to take the message to the Gentiles. And it changed from Jew to Gentile. So let's go look at some more verses here. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. And let's back up a little bit, back before Jesus died. Luke chapter 22, and we'll look at what, what Jesus was telling these, these disciples. Luke 22, 14. And it says, And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And I'm going to read uh, all the way down to verse 22. And then he says, And he said unto them, With desire I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So Jesus says, I'm about to suffer. I'm about to die on the cross. I'm about to shed my blood. So who did Jesus Christ shed his blood for? For his apostles, for his disciples. He died for these Jews just as much as he died for these Gentiles. He's shedding his blood to start his body, his church, the body of Christ. Now, in verse uh, 15, I believe we're in. And when he has said unto them, With desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat any more thereof until I be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Well, when did Jesus come back? 
Well, according to the Bible, after he died, he came back and he visited his apostles. And the Bible tells us that, that he sat down and he actually ate meat with them. And he was actually on the earth for 50 days until he went up again into the clouds. Acts 1, 8, I believe it is, or 11, somewhere in there. Acts chapter 1. So he ate it again, and this started the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Who is he talking to? To those Jewish apostles. Jesus Christ shed his blood for his his disciples, his apostles. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So he's talking about Judas. And Judas is sitting right there eating before Jesus died. And God says, or Jesus says unto him, woe unto you. Now let's go to the book of Acts. Well, sorry, sorry, we're in Luke. Let's stay in Luke 24. Luke 24, what happened after Jesus Christ died? Here we just read a passage where Jesus was telling them, look, I have to suffer, I have to go through some things. And they're sitting there and they're going, well, what's he talking about? Well, Luke chapter 24 and verse 10, it happened. Jesus suffered, he bled, he died for our sins. And when he rose again, what happened? Well, when he rose again, there were some women that came and saw him. And in verse 24, 10, look what it says. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, the mother of uh, excuse me, and Mary, the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. So some women came and talked to the apostles and said, Wow, we saw Jesus rise again. And verse 11, And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. So these early apostles, they saw their Lord crucified, and they're just going, Ah, uh, they killed him. Ah, uh, I don't know what to think. And then Mary and Joanna and these other, Mary, the mother of James, came and said, We just saw Jesus. He rose again from the dead. And they're like, uh, they didn't believe it. Then arose Peter, ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves. So then they went and saw for themselves that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. Now let's go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. What happened to the, the apostles, and when did they get another apostle? Who replaced Judas? Now what I'm going to teach you here is a little controversial. Some people believe that the person who replaced Judas was Matthias. And we're going to look at that. But we also see the Apostle Paul. Now, when we get to the end of this study, we're going to find out, like I told you, that there are only 12 apostles mentioned in the Bible. In fact, at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it says there's only 12 apostles. So which were the 12 apostles? Well, there were 12 to begin, but Judas fell, so that makes 11. So then there had to be a replacement apostle. Well, Peter comes along, and Peter says, well, let's do this. Let's choose, and Peter chose Matthias. The question is, did God choose Matthias, or did God choose Paul? Because we read in the book of Acts that God chose Paul as the... So the question is, did Peter once again do something stupid? As you're reading through the Bible, you've got to remember, watch out for Peter. Because all the time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus says something, and Peter says, Not so, Lord, it's this. And God says, Peter, shut up. When I say something, why are you always saying the opposite? And as you read through the book of Acts, just about every time God says something, Peter says, No, so, Lord, not so. And God says, Yes, Peter. And so Peter is always opening his mouth, inserting his foot, doing stupid things, saying stupid stuff. Even though sometimes he's right. You know, in the book of Matthew, uh, he, Jesus says, Whom do you say that I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Son of, of God. And he says, Well, hast thou said, Peter? And then, and then a couple verses later, God says, Skip me behind me, Satan, <laughs> to Peter. Because Peter says something stupid. Because Jesus says, I'm going to die on the cross and all this. And Peter says, Not so, Lord. He says, Get thee behind me, Satan. So you've got to watch out for Peter. It seems like Peter is always saying and doing the wrong thing. Matter of fact, Peter was the one that denied Jesus Christ three times after he said he wouldn't deny him. Peter's the one that pulled out his sword and cut off the guy's ear. And God says, come on, Peter. He picked the ear up and put it back on the guy. So watch out for Peter. It seems like Peter is always doing the wrong thing. Great guy, used by God. But it seems like Peter was always doing something stupid in the flesh. So what did he do here? Did he do right in what we're about to read in this passage? 
or did he do wrong and God did not accept it? That's what we got to ask, and that's the question. So let's go on. Go to uh, Acts chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 2. And it says, uh, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that through the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So God told the apostles, here's what I want you to do. Go do something. Go do something after Jesus rose. To whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining unto the kingdom of God. This time that Jesus knew would happen, but it was conditional on whether or not they accepted him. Being assembled together with him, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. And then, uh, let me skip down here to verse, because verse 11, that's the verse I was uh, trying to find, actually, verse 9 was the verse I was uh, alluding to earlier. When he had spoken these things, while he beheld, he was taken up in a cloud and received him out of their sight. So Jesus went up in a cloud. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by with him in white apparel. Verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus was taking, taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as we have seen him go into heaven. Now, verse 13, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where they both abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. So here are the eleven disciples. What happened to Judas? Remember there were two Judases, the good Judas, the brother of James, and the bad Judas, Judas Iscariot. Well, verse 15, and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, Men and brethren, this scripture may needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. He was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Now you look, go back to the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it tells us that after Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus Christ and denied him, that he went out and he hung himself because he felt so bad. He took that money, was it 20 or 30 talents of silver, and he took it back to the priest and he threw it down and he said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. And he went out and he hung himself. So he committed suicide, old Judas. Well, here we get more information. It says that he fell headlong and burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. So after he hung himself, either he died and he was hanging there and he fell, or he tried to, to hang himself, and when he did, he fell down and just burst asunder. And, and I don't know if he died by the hanging or if he died by the falling. But after he hung himself, he fell, according to the verses. In verse 19 it says, And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, al Sedama, which is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. So let another take his bishopric, or take his apostleship, and let someone else sit in his stead. That's prophecy. It prophesied from the book of Psalms. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness of us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Okay, now here's what Peter is talking. Peter says, okay, we're going to pick out two people. They picked out a guy named Barsabbas and a guy named Matthias. And then Peter says, now let's cast lots and see which one the Lord wants. You know, Peter never thought, what if the Lord didn't want either one of them? <laughs> and so what do they do? <laughs> Roll the dice. And whatever chance says is the one they pick. Was well, that what God wanted or is that what Peter's idea was? That's the question because, like I said, we'll see in the book of Revelation there's only 12 apostles. But if you take Matthias and then add Paul, then you make 13 apostles. So are there only 12 apostles, or are there 13 apostles? Which is correct. Well, it says here, in verse 24, And they prayed and said, Lord, thou, thou Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may pay, take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So the apostles numbered him with them. 
But you know something interesting? You never, and I mean never, hear this guy anymore in the entire rest of the Bible. So did God choose him, or did the apostles choose him? You know, when you cast lots, that's chance. It doesn't sound like giving God the opportunity to say, hey, this is the one I choose. I mean, why didn't they say, now God, shout down from heaven the one you want. God could have chosen that way. What, casting lots doesn't sound right. So either he was one of the twelve apostles and you just never hear of him anymore, or that's what they did, old Peter, and God didn't accept it. And then the whole rest of the Bible, God says, no, Paul is the one I choose. Peter, listen, this is the one I chose, not him. So that's a subject of debate. That's why I said there's a lot of people that, that uh, this, it's a controversial study because a lot of people say, no, he is one of them. He is one of them. And then others say, no, he's not. Paul is. So which one is it? Well, let's look at some more verses and see if we can figure it out. Before we do, let's go back to verse 21 and 22. In order to be an apostle, a person had to do two things, or had to be part of two things. Verse 21 and 22. Wherefore, these men which have company with us all the time that the Lord went in and out among us. So in order to be an apostle, you had to have lived in Jesus' time. You had to have lived during this time of Jesus' ministry. That's in verse 21. Now look at verse 22. What else did you have to do? Beginning from the baptism of John until that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness of us of his resurrection. So from John to the resurrection. So in order, so John was out here announcing the coming of Jesus. So in order to be an apostle, you had to have lived in this time. Now there's out here people, like that guy I told you that's up the road that has his apostolic church that says, I'm an apostle. Well, he's way out here. i got a question for that guy. Did he ever see John the Baptist? Did he ever see Jesus? Did he ever live during the time of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? No, he didn't. So how could he have been an apostle? He can't. He's not an apostle. The apostles only lived back in this time, starting from the baptism of John all the way up to the resurrection. And then they lived after that, and they died out. But the Apostle Paul lived during that time. I'm sure the Apostle Paul probably saw John the Baptist baptizing, because he was one of the Pharisees. He would have gone out with the Pharisees and watched. I'm almost 100% certain that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, the Apostle Paul was there watching that, because all of Israel came out to see him die. Paul was persecuting Christians after Jesus died. So you think he would have seen Jesus on the cross of Calvary. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 9, when he's on the road to, Ima uh, to Damascus, I believe it is, or wherever he's going, he's going to kill Christians, and then there's a vision in heaven, and the Lord appears unto him. And you know what he says? He says, Lord, Lord. So he knew the Lord. How would he know it was the Lord had he not seen the Lord Jesus Christ die on the cross? So I personally believe that he saw that. That's why God could make Paul an apostle, because Paul did live during that time. Now let's look at some more verses. In Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. Romans 11, 13. Paul tells us dogmatically that he is an apostle. That's why the apostle Paul is so important. He's one of God's chosen apostles. Romans 11, 13. For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am in a Gentile uh, the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So the apostle Paul says, hey, this is something that I am. I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, and I magnify my office. God's called me to be an apostle. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 9. And that he was seen of Cephas, which is another name for Simon Peter, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. What does that mean, one born out of due time? Because there was a time in which the apostles existed. God chose them before he died. He usually called them disciples. But he also called them apostles. But they were more apostles here because the apostles had signs and wonders. Even though they did signs and wonders here, it's, we call them more apostles during this time and more disciples during this time. And so here was the time of the apostles from here to here, probably a seven-year period. 
Well, over here, Paul says, I was born out of due time. So he was born out of the time when the apostles started. He, so what does that mean? That means he was the last apostle. So that means Paul equals the last apostle. There are no other apostles after the apostle Paul. He's the last one. And he's the apostle to the Gentiles when these were apostles to Jews. That doesn't mean they only went to Jews. We read in the book of Acts how Peter went to some Gentiles as well. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8, he says, As of one born out of due time, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, and am not meant to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the, the church of God. So Paul persecuted the church. What is the church? Well, Jesus Christ died for a body, and the body is the church, and the church is the body. So Paul persecuted these early Christians over here, the Jewish early Christians. So Paul, without a doubt, was an apostle. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. See what happens when you read the Bible? It's so easy to understand things. You can't go to a church out here and have a guy say, well, I'm an apostle. No, you're not. The very last apostle was a Paul, and he was born out of due time, but he was the last one. There are no apostles today. 2 Corinthians 12, 11. It says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So the apostles were followers of Christ. There were only so many chosen, and there was something that marked them. They had signs and wonders. Now you go to 1 Corinthians 1, 22, it tells us that the Jews seek after signs. So the Jews needed these signs, and God used these signs through these apostles to prove to the Jews that he was their Messiah. But then Paul had those signs and wonders, and he used it to the Jews also. A couple of times he used it toward the Gentiles. But as you read through Paul's writings, which by the way are Romans through Philemon, you know what you find out? You find out that these signs ceased. They ended. Why? Why did these signs and wonders cease? Why did the apostles stop? Well, Paul says it best, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Paul says, We live by faith, not by sight. You see, the Jews needed to see a sign to believe. But Gentiles trust based on evidence, and they have faith. So we have a change from the apostles doing signs and wonders to Jews living by sight and trusting Jesus as the Messiah by sight, to the Jews being petered out, if you will, the Jews uh, changing from Jew to Gentile, salvation, and then the gospel is by faith. Believing in the gospel rather than trusting in miracles. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1, and verse 17. I just wish people would get this. It's just so frustrating to hear people today say, well, I'm an apostle. No, you're not. No, you're not. You didn't live in this time period. And you can't be because Paul said he was born out of due time. He said, I'm the last one. Let me show you that. Galatians 1, 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. So look at this. He says, which were apostles before me. So the apostle Paul says, there were people before me that were apostles. There was 11 of them, maybe 12. Depends on if you accept Matthias or not. But then he says, I was one born out of due season. And then he says, time and again, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, that's Romans 11, 13. He says, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. So he is the last, the last Apostle. So nowhere in the Bible do you read, after Paul, anyone calling themselves an apostle. Nowhere after the Apostle Paul are there any more apostles. That means today there are no apostles. But there were some people who the Bible calls false apostles. There were some people after Paul standing up and saying, well, I'm an apostle too. And Paul says, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm the last apostle. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11.13 about such people. 
He says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Now look what he says, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. What does that mean? That means they're trying to pretend to be something they're not. They're trying to transform themselves into apostles of Christ. And Paul says, nope, no such thing. I'm the last one. God started with the apostles over here, and there's no more after me. He says they're transforming themselves into the apostles, but what are they? They're false apostles. They're not true apostles of Christ. He says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, who, whose end shall be according to, their words, to his words. So if a man stands up today in the church age and says, I'm an apostle, he's a liar. He's trying to transform himself into something that he's not. He is lying to you. He's probably a minister of Satan, according to verse 15. Because Satan has his ministers, and they're connected with false apostles. So be careful of people today that say, well, I'm an apostle. No, you're not. We've looked at the verses. Let's go look, we're going to look at some more. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at some more. You see, it's a transition that took place in the book of Acts. And that transition is over from Jews to Gentiles. And God used the apostles and he used the signs so the Jews would believe. And thank God many Jews did believe. And when they did, they became part of the body of Christ. But the Jewish nation as a whole rejected God, so he rejected them. And then he went to the Gentiles with the message of salvation. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Let's look at what the Bible says. Well, let's look at verse 27 first. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. What is the body of Christ? Well, after Jesus died, he died to set up his body. And the body of Christ, according to other verses we've looked at in our other uh, videos, if you get a chance, go to cloudchurch.org, look under Bible studies, and watch the video on what is the church? When did the church start? What is the church? The church is called the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is the church. Jesus Christ said, Upon this rock I will build my church. He is the rock. Jesus is the rock. So Jesus built a church with both Jew and Gentile in it, in the body of Christ. Now look what it says. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Verse 28. And God has set some in the church. Now watch what it says. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Verse 29. Are all apostles? No. No, there were only 12 to begin with, and then Paul was the last one. Are all apostles? No, not all are apostles. And then it says, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yea, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. There's a more excellent way. There's a way which Paul says, I show you, which is living by faith, not by sight. Trusting the gospel, not trusting uh, something else. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Just looking at a couple verses. I know this has taken up most of our class, but it's just so in, important. And it's a good place to talk about this. Ephesians 2, 20. Ephesians 2, 20 says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord, and with whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, what is he talking about there? Built upon the foundation of the apostles. What is built? Verse 16, his body. He built a body. And it says in verse 17, For through him we both, both Jew and Gentile, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles. So it's talking about the body of Christ, the church. It's built upon the foundation of the apostles. So it started with the apostles. They were first, we saw in the other verse, and Paul was the last apostle. Ephesians 4.11 is another, another good place. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the body of Christ started with the apostles. And it mentions some prophets there. Now, 2 Corinthians... 12.12, 12, again, I think we might have read this earlier, but 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, look at what this says. 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12. so we see that the body of Christ started with the apostles. I'm in 1 Corinthians, my bad. 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12. and it says here, Truly the signs of an apostle 
were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And uh, look at verse, verse 11 also. I am become a fool in glory. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chief apostles, though I be nothing. Paul didn't look at himself as a, as a great and wonderful person. He said, you know, I'm, I'm nothing compared to these. You know, I am an apostle like they are, but I come behind them. I'm the last apostle. And there were signs and wonders that we apostles had. But we don't have those signs and wonders today. We live by faith, not by sight. Signs, 1 Corinthians 1.22, to Jews, not to us who are Gentiles. So now let's, with all that, let's bring it all together in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, if you want to know more about the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, go to cloudchurch.org and go to the Bible studies. But the Bible calls the body of Christ, it's also known as the bride of Christ. Or it's also called the church. Well, the bride of Christ is also called New Jerusalem in heaven. Paul even says, New Jerusalem, which is above, he says, which is for us, Christians. So, the church, the body of Christ, all saved people, are known as the bride, the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ is called New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. And look what it says about New Jerusalem. Let's go to... Uh, Oh, let's go to Revelation chapter 1, 21. Revelation 21, 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride ordained, adorned, I almost said ordained, adorned for her husband. And then verse 9 tells him, Come hither, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried him away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, sending out of heaven, from God. So what is New Jerusalem? It's the bride of Christ. Huh. Alright, so look, let's read. And it says in verse 12, And had a great wall, and high, and great gates, and twelve gates, and twelve angels were names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Okay, interesting. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in the name of the and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he talked with me, and, and on and on and on. So here we have, if you will, New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem is called the Bride of the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. So the Bride of Christ, which is also the Body of Christ. The Bible says that New Jerusalem is like a city four square. A lot of people say it's kind of like a, a diamond. Like a pyramid on top, pyramid on the bottom. There's three gates of pearl on each side. And then it says there that the names of the apostles are written in the wall of the city. The names of the twelve apostles. So here's the walls of the city. So there's twelve names of the apostles on the walls of the city of New Jerusalem. Now I got a question. Was Judas one of those twelve? No. The scriptures say that he was taken out and someone else came in his place. So who was the twelfth apostle mentioned there? Was it Matthias or was it Paul? That's the subject of much controversy today. Some people say it had to be Matthias. Paul is the thirteenth apostle, so he's listed somewhere else. Or could it be that Peter picked Matthias, but God didn't? And God is showing you through the rest of the Bible, I didn't pick him, I picked him. And so Paul's name will be written, because Paul is a part of the body of Christ. I don't know. All I know is there are no more apostles today. The apostles are gone. And all I know is that God did choose Paul as our apostle today. So if you are a Christian, you're to follow the apostle Paul. Because we live in this time period when God went away from working with the Jews to working with us. And we're out here real close to the end, to the rapture, if you will. And so now, today... We can only come to God through Paul's writings and what God revealed unto Paul. You get a chance to go to cloudchurch.org. Uh, it's either in past sermons or some of the Bible study videos of things that God revealed unto the Apostle Paul. So important that we follow Paul. But you can't read Paul's writings without seeing that he was an apostle, the very last one. Uh, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and separated unto the gospel of of God. So Paul is called to be apostle and to preach something to us. What is he to preach to us Gentiles? The gospel. 
And we'll look at the gospel here in a little bit. 1 Corinthians 1 1, 2 Corinthians 1 1, Galatians 1 1, Ephesians 1 1, Colossians 1 1, 1 Timothy 1 1, 2 Timothy 1 1. Paul tells us over and over and over, I am an apostle. And he's the last one. No time after him ever is there another guy that steps up and says, Now I'm an apostle too. There can only be 12. And there are only 12 apostles. So anybody who stands up today and says, I'm an apostle, you're a liar. You are a liar. You need to shut up and quit saying things that are against the Word of God. There are no apostles today. You can be a preacher. You can be an evangelist. You can be a pastor. But you are not an apostle. Now, let's go to 1 Timothy 2.7 real quick. Just two more verses where Paul says he's an apostle. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. For the mystery... Uh, let's see. I'm in 1 Thessalonians. No wonder. 1 Timothy 2.7 says... He says, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ, and I lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verity means truth. So he says, I am called to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher to us Gentiles. So he is our apostle today, the apostle to the Gentiles. 2 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1, excuse me, 2 Timothy 1.11. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11 the apostle paul the apostle paul says this whereunto i am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the gentiles we just saw that in the other verse and here he says it again paul is a preacher he is an apostle and he is a teacher if you want what god wants you to have today for us in the church age you need to go to paul because God specially called this man, the last apostle, for us Gentiles to give us the doctrine for the church age today. A lot of people say, well, what about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written back here. And yeah, there's some stuff in John that can't apply to us today. But most of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is all Old Testament. Because the New Testament doesn't start until Jesus dies. So why are so many churches today spending all their time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Why aren't they spending their time in Romans through Philemon? Because that's the doctrine for the church, for the body of Christ, for us today in the time in which we live. After the rapture, then it'll go back to those books. A lot of the books of Hebrews and James and even First and Second Peter will apply to this period, the tribulation. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We got through one, one or two verses. Chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Clearly Paul is an apostle. Am I not free? Clearly, Paul is free. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Well, I think he saw him on the cross when he died. But Acts chapter 9 says that he saw him in heaven as well. So he's seen Jesus Christ. He was even stoned in Lystra and went up to heaven and saw him. So there's at least three times that he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Are ye not my, he says, are not ye my work in the Lord? He led them to the Lord. They got saved because of Him. Because of him. They became a body, part of the body of Christ because of Him. They, they became part of New Jerusalem because of Him. So he says, are you not my work in the Lord? Are you not proof that I am called of God because I won you all to the Lord? Verse, 12, uh, verse 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 2. If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. What does that mean? You are the seal of my apostleship because God called him to be to the Gentiles. So the book of Corinth is written to who? The book of 1st and 2nd Corinth is written to Gentiles. And he saw these Gentiles saved, and he's saying, because you're Gentiles and you got saved, are you not a seal of my apostleship, that I am indeed the apostle to the Gentiles? <laughs> it's an I mean, can you see it? I mean, it's so plain. It's right there. If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am to you, for the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. So Paul says, there are people out there that are, that are questioning, who am I? Because we read earlier, I believe it's in chapter 3, that there were people out there saying, well, I'm of Peter. No, I'm of, I'm of Apollo, so I'm of so-and-so. Well, I'm of Paul. Well, those people that say I'm of Peter, they're trying to go back under this, trying to get back under here. And I guess they're trying to set up signs and wonders. We, we don't need signs and wonders. We live by sight, uh, faith, not by sight. So, we can't go back and follow Peter. We can't go back and follow the early apostles. Their doctrine is not the doctrine for us today. As a matter of fact, when Peter showed up, what was he preaching? 
Was he preaching the gospel? When Peter preached, preached, he preached death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, but he didn't say trust that for salvation. Matter of fact, what he said was in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Holy Ghost, and you will receive the mission of sins. So Peter was preaching water baptism to be forgiven of your sins. Water baptism to wash sins away. As the book of Acts continues, Paul comes along and God reveals to Paul, and Paul reveals unto Peter and the early apostles, Look, it's by grace alone, not by works, not by water baptism, not by anything we do. It's by grace through faith alone that we're saved. And who stands up? Peter in Acts 15 and says, We believe that through the grace of God we shall be saved even as they. So Paul straightened out the early apostles to begin to preach the true gospel rather than preaching a gospel of signs and wonders and water baptism to preaching the gospel of trust alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I call this the difference between the, the who versus what of salvation. You know what? I don't think I've ever heard a, another minister ever preach this. But I don't see how you can read the book of Acts without seeing this. When those apostles showed up preaching to Jews, all the emphasis on was on the name of Jesus and trusting in the name. And it was all trust in who Jesus is because the, the, uh, the Jews had to trust that Jesus was their Messiah. Well, as the book of Acts goes on, less and less does it say believe in who Jesus is and trust in his name. More and more does it begin to say trust in what Jesus did. Trust in the finished work. Trust that Jesus not only is the Messiah, but that what he did was for our justification. You see, for our justification. It's what Jesus did. It's not just who he was. Yes, Jesus is God. Yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, Jews need to know that. But for us Gentiles to be saved, that doesn't matter to us that he was the Messiah to the Jews. What matters is whether or not we trust what he did as sufficient to save us. What did he do to save us? He shed his blood for our sins. Let's go to the 1 Corinthians 15 real quick. I've mentioned several times the gospel, the gospel. Well, this is the gospel that was revealed to Paul, that God told Paul to preach to the Gentiles. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, I'm running out of room up here, 1 through 4. And the gospel has five points. The five points of the gospel. What are they? Well, let's read it. First Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So there's five points of this gospel. Well, I ran out of room here. Um, I'll just go ahead and erase that. The five points of the gospel, what are they? Christ died. Who's Christ? He's the Messiah. But what did the Messiah do? You see, it's not just who he was that saves. It's what did he do for us. He, he Christ died for our sins. He was buried. But thank God it doesn't end there. He rose again. And the Bible says twice according to to the scriptures. Why does it make that so important that it mentions it twice? Because everything that Jesus did, and you see this is all about what he did. This over here was all about who he was. So do you see the difference of preaching from Gentile to Jew? When Jesus came, he said, go only to the Jews. And when he rose again, he proved to the Jewish nation, I am your Messiah, I am God, because only God could raise from the dead. And he told those apostles, go out and preach who I am, preach my name, and tell them to believe in who I am. All throughout the book of John, it's believe in Jesus, believe in the name of Jesus. But as Paul came along, and the Jewish nation rejected, God told Paul, here's the gospel. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. He said, go out and preach what I did for you. Christ died for our sins, so it's the difference between who Jesus is and what Jesus is. Now let me show you real quickly Acts chapter 13. What was it that Paul preached that was different from what Peter and the early apostles preached? It's right here. <laughs> it's so amazing. In Acts chapter 13, the apostle Paul, in verses 1 through 4, is called and separated and sent out as a missionary to preach to other people. He goes out and he preaches and he comes back to the early church. And when he comes back, he begins to preach some things and look what he says. 
Well, here's verse 16. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. And he begins to preach. Okay? He starts preaching, and as you look down there in verse 38, you see what he preached that's different from what Paul, uh, Peter and the early apostles. Peter and the early apostles preached who Jesus was. They were emphasis was on the name, trust that he's the Messiah. They said many times Jesus died and was buried and rose again. But they never told people uh, until about Acts 15 to trust in that. They just mentioned it. They mentioned it like a murder indictment. You guys killed him, but he rose again. You guys killed him, but he rose again. Now trust in who he is. Trust his name. But when Paul shows up, he mentions the death, burial, and resurrection. Christ died, was buried, and rose again. But look what he says. He says, for something. What was it for? Acts 13, 30. But you... But he whom God hath raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, verse 39, all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. So it's for our justification. So over here you believed in who Jesus was, you trusted who he was. Yes, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe who He is. But when God changed from Peter to Paul, He said, Now the message isn't just who I am. You have to believe that what I did for you on the cross of Calvary was sufficient to save you. It was to justify you. It was for forgiveness of sins. A lot of people, they just do not understand the book of Acts. Peter over here in Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, that you may receive the Holy... You had to do something, you had to repent and be baptized, to get forgiveness, while you believed who Jesus was. But the book of Acts is a transition, and it transitioned, and it changed. And then God revealed, hey, you don't do anything for salvation, you trust what Jesus already did. Because that, right there, the gospel, is what saves us. It's not just believing who Jesus is anymore that will give you a salvation. It's trusting what Jesus did. It's trusting the gospel. And I believe the gospel is what was revealed to Paul. Even though Peter and James and John preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, they didn't preach trust that for salvation. They preached that, but then, then tried to say, now trust who he is. But Paul, God said, now preach what I did. And tell people they're saved by what I did, not just who I am. They're saved by trusting what I did, trusting the gospel. Romans 2, let's go real quickly to Romans chapter 2. This is why the Apostle Paul is so important, so important. Romans chapter 2 tells us that salvation is through trusting the Apostle Paul's gospel. That is, trusting the gospel that God revealed to the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 2, and verse 16. The Apostle Paul says, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So the Apostle Paul says, you want to be saved today? You have to come through my writings. I'm the last apostle. You have to come through the revelations that God revealed unto me. And God revealed unto me something important. That we're not saved by just trusting what or who Jesus was. The only way to be saved today is trusting what Jesus Christ did. Uh, the finished work of Calvary, the death, burial, and resurrection. But you don't just trust the death, burial, and resurrection, you trust that it's for our justification, that it's for our forgiveness. So when you come to Christ and you trust Him as your Savior, you trust what He's done for you, you trust that it was done to forgive you. And when you're trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for your salvation, then you believe you're saved. And you know that your sins are forgiven. Why are your sins forgiven? Because they're washed in the blood. See, I'm blood washed. I'm free in Christ through the blood atonement because I have eternal life. Because what Jesus did for me was sufficient to save me. I'm not just trusting that Jesus is the Messiah. I know who Jesus is. But just because I know who Jesus is doesn't mean I'm saved. You know, even the devils believe and tremble. The Bible says in the book of James, what do they believe? They believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So it's not enough just to believe who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, that he's God. It was at the beginning. That's what the Jews were supposed to believe. 
But just because you believe who Jesus is doesn't mean you're saved. Even Satan himself knows who Jesus is. Is he saved? No. So what do you have to believe in to be saved? Trust in what Jesus did for you. And what did he do? He died, was buried, and rose again, according to the scriptures, for our justification, for the forgiveness of our sins. If you trust that, then you're saved. I guess that's as far as we'll get today. So let me ask you this. Are you saved? Are you a Christian? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? There are a lot of people in churches today that claim to be Christians and they're confused about all these things. A lot of them think Acts 2.38 is the way to heaven and getting baptized in water. But that won't save you. A lot of people think, well, if I do good works, we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith, not by works. Are you saved? Have you come to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's what it boils down to. Have you heard the gospel? Are you trusting in what Jesus did for you? A lot of people think, well, it's through the early apostles that we can get to heaven. No, it's through the last apostle, the Apostle Paul. So I appreciate you being here today. Um, we'll see you back next time. And I want you to think about these things and think about this. Are you saved? Do you know beyond any shadow, shadow of a doubt that if you were to die right now, you would go to heaven when you die? Do you know that you're saved? That's the question. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.